Well, welcome to the podcast today. My name is Jeff, and our guest today is a returning guest. Uh, it's good to have Ruth Guggenheim back on the podcast. Ruth is the Director of Interfaith Relations for World Emuna in Jerusalem, Israel. She has worked in the Jewish communal field for over 40 years, whether as a religious school teacher, an agency director in the Jewish Federation field, or as an outreach worker, engaging individuals on their unique journey and relationship with God. Uh, Ruth made Aliyah to Israel in 2016 and began working at World Emuna on behalf of the disadvantaged and at-risk children and families in Israel, where she continues to work today. Ruth, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Jeff. Thank you so much for having me back. Well, it's good to have you. And uh, last time we talked about uh, one of the Jewish holidays. We talked about Purim. And today we are talking about uh, the biblical holiday of Shavuot, or Pentecost, as most of us evangelical Christians might know the name. Uh, this Jewish holiday begins sunset June 4th, um, I guess next week. And uh, as a pastor in the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, this holiday is quite significant for, for me. Uh, but some Christians are not really aware of where the celebration of Pentecost originally came from and that it was a uh, Jewish celebration. So today we're going to talk about that. And uh, just point of interest, you may notice if you're watching that uh, I'm not in my usual spot. I'm actually in a hotel room in Haifa, Israel, and uh, Ruth is in Jerusalem, and we're talking today. So, so this is coming to you from the land of Israel, just so you're aware. I just wanted everybody to know that. Uh, Ruth, can you talk a little bit, tell us a little bit about Shavuot or Pentecost from a Jewish perspective. What does the word mean and when and why do Jews celebrate this holiday? Okay, Jeff, first of all, welcome to Israel. It's an honor to have you back here on the Holy Land. So um, the word Shavuot literally means weeks. And it's from the, the Bible, it's from the uh, Hebrew scriptures where in Levit Leviticus, God commands the Jewish people, the Israelites to one, start counting what's called the Sphira, the Omer. And what that was is from the day after the Israelites left Egypt the, from the Exodus until the giving of the 10 commandments and the biblical imperatives from the Torah, from the Bible, and Revelation, which was exactly 50 days after, the Jews were commanded to count 49 days until Revelation. And that again is called the Sfirata Omer, counting of the Omer. And it is found in Leviticus in chapter 23. And one may say, okay, why does one have to count 49 days? You know, 49 days actually means seven weeks. Okay. Seven right. times seven is 49 days, the 50th day with revelation. And there's a, a few reasons, actually. One is that biblically, we believe very strongly that there are 50 spherot uh, are the divine attributes of God, that each one of us, each person was given the, the attributes of God. We know that we are created in God's image. So if we're created in God's image, what does that mean? It means the divine calling, the essence that God created us with. And we believe very strongly that there are, that when the Jewish people, the Israelites were actually slaves in Egypt, they had lowered themselves spiritually by 49 steps, it says. that we kind of like hit rock bottom. We were slaves. Okay. We were not free to practice. We were not free to have our own uh, religious beliefs, even though it was pre-giving of the Torah, there is a tradition that the Israelites already knew certain things that handed down from the patriarchs and the matriarchs, but that we had kind of hit rock bottom. And the only thing that the Israelites maintained in servitude in Egypt were their Israelite names, the names from the land of Canaan, the name of, of the Israelites. So um, in order to prepare ourselves for hearing and being a part of God's revelation at the at the Mount Sinai at Har Sinai we had to 
increase ourselves. We had to work on ourselves, transform ourselves, transcend where we were as slaves and raise ourselves up to that spiritual place where we would be able to be in partners or married to God. The holiday of Shavuot means also not only was it revelation when God gave us the Torah and spoke to us, but we were married to God, so to speak, you know, in a spiritual context. So right. the Svira, counting of the Omer, one was those 49 levels each day that we count between the second day of Passover until the giving until Shavuot, until the holiday, we work on ourselves individually and collectively to try to, again, a, maintain and attain a higher level of spirituality to reconnect with God. The other is a very agricultural-based thing. Shavuot also is, is evolves totally around the harvest and the seasons here in Israel. And we know that the Omer was a a um, measurement of barley. And that's to remind us that in Passover, it starts the harvesting season. And then on the holiday of Shavuot is when we come to fruition, when the fruits start and everything. So not only do does Shavuot commemorate the giving of the Torah on Sinai, the giving of the Ten Commandments in the Bible and Revelation, but also the first fruits in the Holy Land of Israel. So that's, that's a part of Shavuot. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have any questions, but one of the, so there are a few actual interesting traditions that maybe some of your followers also know. We read the book of Ruth, the, the biblical book of Ruth, which is one of the, the five uh, Megillah, we call it. And people say, okay, why the book of Ruth? Well, Ruth was an amazing woman, first of all. Many of us may know that she was, she was a, um, from the, tribe of Moab. She was actually a Moabitess. She was a princess. She and her sister-in-law who married into Elisheva, in, into Naomi's family and all that. The story goes on that there was a famine. They had gone. They had left Israel. They had gone down, gone to Moab and they got married there. Ruth ultimately, when she becomes a widow, goes back with Naomi. This is a condensed. She goes back with Naomi to the land of Israel and, and Naomi says, go back, go, go to your own people. I have nothing to offer you. And her sister-in-law, Oprah, goes back. But Ruth says, no, your people will be my people. Wherever you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. So it's the ultimate connection to God and saying, I want to be a part of your people. So the Torah being given on Shavuot and Ruth accepting the Torah and becoming a follower of, of the Israelites it, it's a perfect role model for us. So that's one of the reasons we obviously read that book on Shavuot. And also it's during the harvest season. She um, she had a glean in the, in the fields of Boaz, Boaz being a great leader within the Jewish community from the tribe of Judah. He would make sure when he realized that this was actually his family, she was a widow from one of his cousins, that the people, his employees would make sure to leave extra wheat in the field because there is a biblical mandate, as you know, Jeff, where if any of the gleanings fall down, it is you are required to leave them in the fields for the poor and the needy to come and get it. That's an amazing, you know, uh, right. humanitarian aid that started thousands of years ago. So that story of Ruth is read on Shavuot as a part of one, the harvest, and also here is somebody who was not born into the Jewish faith or into the Israelite. Uh, nation and accepted on herself the, the, the commandments. Uh, very good. Uh, that's uh, extremely interesting. I love the connection with the story of Ruth and, uh, you know, humanitarian aid is something that our organization loves to help with in Israel. And so there's a long, uh, a long time connection to the, the biblical story with that. Uh, you mentioned about the counting of the Omer. You talked about uh, some of those details. How was Shavuot celebrated in biblical times other than uh, those, those few things that you mentioned? Was there anything else that, uh, that happened during the celebration of Shavuot back in the ancient days? In, in biblical days. So to my awareness, one, it, it, Shavuot is one of the three pilgrim holidays where Jews were um, dictated basically to go to the base of Mikdash to the Holy Temple in Jerusalem and pay pilgrimage. Okay. If, if the whole family could go, they would go. If not, it would usually just be the father, but they, it was literally one of the three festive holidays. That is the, uh, that is a biblical mandate. Uh, in, in Hebrew, we call it the Shalosh Regalim. The three, Regalim means feet, the three feet, meaning that th these were the three holidays where one would actually walk 
to Jerusalem or go to Jerusalem to bring the first fruits. One of the commandments biblically is that you did bring your first fruit to the base of Mikdash for the Levites and for the Kohanim and also to to pay gratitude to Hashem, to God, for your harvest. It's, right. The Torah is an amazing thing because we really were raised to believe very strongly in the connection between God and the land and that God provides for the land. When we are on the land, if we're doing what we're supposed to do, our covenant with God, then the rain comes and God will make sure that there's plenty of food and there won't be as many needy people. And we see that happening now where there's food and, and Israel, thank God, is blessed now with abundance and everything. Not that we're doing everything right, don't get me wrong, but I'm saying it's it's like that is a part of the biblical covenant between God and the Israelites that he gave us a Torah. We are covenanted to be his people, to take care of this land. And when going to the Holy Temple in Jerusalem at the time and bringing our first fruits, acknowledge the fact that without God, our land, our bounty, our food is all relied on by God's grace to all of us. So that was really important. The other, you know, they would, um, the base of Mikdash, the Holy Temple, and now today synagogues and homes in recognition of the harvest holiday and the, and the new fruits and, and the flowers, we would dec we decorate um, our homes and our synagogues kind of, again, symbolically to appreciate that it, it's with God's grace that we have all of this bounty. Wonderful. Now, just, uh, you know, to add a little bit of, uh, of our perspective, you know, in the Christian Bible, it was during this feast that uh, the story is told that the mm -hmm. disciples gathered in the upper room after the uh, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And Pentecost is the the day that they were all there in the upper room when the uh, when the Holy Spirit was was poured out. And of course, the story mentions the fact that there were many Jewish people from all over the world in the city of Jerusalem who who witnessed this event. And so it goes to what you were speaking about, about the, the pilgrim holiday and so on. Uh, you referenced a couple of uh, things, uh, you know, decorating your homes, your synagogues. How else is Shavuot celebrated today? So uh, uh, there is a tradition to eat dairy food. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And one of the traditions come from the fact that th it comes from two things. One is that Israel is considered the land flowing with milk and honey. We know that from the Bible, that this is an abundant land with milk and honey. And so we eat dairy food for a few reasons. One is to commemorate that wherever we are in the world, we remember that God's land, the land of Israel, the Holy Land is is, is abundant with milk and honey. So it's customary to make cheesecake, have blintzes, have dairy food. The other thing is similar to a mother's milk, uh, an infant, the only food that they get for the first couple of months of their life is the mother's milk. And it's full of nutrients and it's full of love. And that's symbolic too of God's love for all of us that his word, his directive, is like nutrient. It is all the vitamins and sustenance we ultimately need as people from, from a spiritual point of view. So that's another reason why, you know, re eating dairy foods is very common. Many, many people have the custom of spending Shavuot uh, in, the, in night studying Torah all night long in partnership or learning as much as they can, one about the holidays and about the land of Israel. So that's a custom that's been carried on for thousands of years. If one can't stay up all night, they don't have to. Again, it's a custom, but it is practiced literally worldwide and it has gotten even more recognition as, as the Jewish community has also re-engaged in studying the Torah very significantly. Spending the night in, in study is, is exactly uh, one of the things we do on Shavuot. So I think, uh, I don't know if there's any other customs you're thinking of in particular, Jeff. Well, I just wanted to I just wanted to hear from you uh, what what things were were sort of observed as uh, you celebrate the holiday today. Now, I want to ask uh, about the studying of the Torah, because uh, I believe this is connected to the fact that, um, you know, Shavuot is also a celebration of the giving of the Torah that, that God gave the law to the Israelites. And, and this is what's being marked here. My understanding, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, the idea is that it took about 
uh, 50 days or, or 49 days, seven weeks for the Israelites to get from the crossing of the Red Sea to Sinai. Am I, am I right about that? From, yes, but that was the physical 49 days. Remember, there are two aspects to the counting of the Omer. One had to do with the physical. Right. Um, though they actually were encamped around Sinai three days before, it says. Okay, so it was really a very spiritual uplifting those 49 days to the 50th day of preparation. God wanted them encamped and they had to prepare themselves in encampment. You know, they had to, they, they did settle in and then they um, they spiritually continued to improve their lot and to pray in recognition that God was going to be giving the Torah. It, it was, Revelation was something that the whole world heard at the time, as you most likely have learned. You know, it, we believe that when God spoke the two first commandments of the Ten Commandments, everything stood still in the world. Not only, you know, before his, he, he spoke, was there chauffeur blastings and everything, but and lightning and thunder. But the birds heard it. Everything stood still. The insects, everything came to a total standstill because God revealed himself to the entire world. Hmm. Very and, interesting. And it's interesting, you know, I wanted, it's very interesting if I can kind of go back a little bit to Ruth, to the story of Ruth, who again is a role model for us. And we read the story uh, customarily because she accepted upon herself the, 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 the Torah, the, the commandments. And um, her Hebrew name is Rush, Resh, Resh Vav Tuf. And as you may know, that all letters in the Jewish um, alphabet have an equivalent numerical value. It's called gematria. So we take very seriously from a very Kabbalistic, mystical point of view of what all of our letters mean and, and how things spell out. And, and it's kind of like a hidden code in the Torah. The letters for the name Ruth, Resh is 200. Vav is six and tough is 400. You add that up, it equals 606. Why 606? Because as a Moabitess, as a Gentile, she already had the seven laws of Noah were already were commanded to the entire world on some level, we believe. So as a Moabite woman, she was doing and already obligated to those seven Noahide laws. Now she took on 606 more. We we believe that there are 613 teachings in the Torah. You know, a lot of people call them commandments. They really aren't laws and commandments from that point of view. They're teachings. And clearly that they impact everyone. Not all 613 teachings and commandments are done by everyone. There are laws that are specific for the priests. There are laws that are specific for the Levites. There are laws that are specific only in the in the the Holy Temple and the base of Mikdash. There are laws that are exclusive for men, laws that are exclusive for women. There are laws for the co for the uh, kings. So people say like, oh, wow, how can you guys do 613 commandments? Isn't that like crazy? It would be. We don't have 613 that every one of us are obligated to do. We have 613 teachings and mitzvot, mitzvot being righteousness, actually, that God gave mm. us to improve ourselves and how to connect with God. And that, so why Ruth was another reason was she had already had the seven. Now she took on 606 additional ones to be 613. Very intriguing. Now, let's, so I want to talk a little bit more about the Ruth story because, uh, uh, there are some great connections. You talked about the gleaning, you know, harvest time, mm -hmm. uh, some of those kind of connections. But, you know, I'm wondering, I'm just thinking about this. I mean, Ruth is one of the most, uh, uh, from my perspective, famous uh, love stories in the Bible as well. And, uh, you know, you referenced that uh, this idea of, of marriage to God and 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 maybe even there's a connection here to a love for the Torah, for the for the word of God. Talk a little bit about, about any of that. Um, <laughs> well, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. There's two distinct love stories. I mean, some people consider the story of Ruth and Boaz to be a tremendous love story. Here's this guy who takes her in and, and um, takes care of her. And Naomi, her mother-in-law, is also given um, some peace and everything. So some people consider that a tremendous love story. We don't look at that as tr necessarily a tremendous love story. It, it's a part of God's 
plan for us. I mean, that, that I would say is a distinction. Our modern day concept of love stories is not the biblical concept of love stories. And I know you, you can appreciate that. Biblically, there was responsibility. There was mutual respect. There was the idea of growth and empowerment together. And Boaz enabled Ruth to fulfill her destiny. Um, it, it's interesting, the Mephorosh, the um, uh, the Mephorosh, the scriptures teaches us, not in the written scripture, that Boaz actually passed away right after they got married. He was able to, uh, they were able to get pregnant together. Boaz became the father uh, of, of it. And um, ultimately from his lineage comes Messiah, comes King David, King Solomon, and any of the uh, ultimate lineage to the Messiah. So, but he kind of leaves the story pretty quickly, but it's the idea that through his empowerment, Ruth becomes a phenomenal empowered woman, okay? Mm. And is able to fulfill her destiny as someone who enters into the Jewish covenant and becomes a great grandmother of King David. Think of how powerful that is. And I, I would say it's a message to all of us that regardless of where we start in lives, our destinies, we, we have so much opportunity and destiny that we don't always know what God has faded for us for us and that's the story of all of our patriarchs matriarchs and people like ruth is here she was an innocent young woman who becomes like this powerhouse well i love all of those things that you uh, that you mentioned and i think that they're incredible lessons that we can learn but uh, you know just from my perspective i still think it's an amazing love story whether or not that's Go the point <laughs> Yeah, I really do. Nobody can and... complain with a good love story. It's a, it's a feel good piece. But if you look at the fact, if, if the Meforshim are correct and he actually passed away right after they had their first night together, it wasn't much of a love story. It was cut short. Well, it was premature. <laughs> well, okay. But uh, I think there are still some, some, uh, some interesting things there. And we can learn a lot from, uh, from the story of Ruth and from this. Uh, this holiday uh, of Shavuot. Now, um, what are we missing? Is there anything more about this that we should be uh, drawing out for our listeners today, Ruth? I think it's an opportunity. What I would like to say is that I think what we should be drawing out is how both faith communities have the same origins and we should work together to unify our efforts on behalf of the entire global family to bring the message of God to everybody. And I would say that's what hmm. Lewis is about because Revelation, I don't think any of us can appreciate at all what happened at Revelation, you know, what it meant to stand there at, at the Temple Mount, to have the, the earth trembling, to have the power of the chauffeur, to hear God's voice so much. The, the Israelites were, were yearning for this. And then after the first two commandments, they actually, they panicked, they screamed at it, it said they fainted. They couldn't handle the power of God's voice. It was so all encompassing. And then Moses had to mm. over the rest, as we know, in the Sinai. So what's the power behind that? The power is though, that God didn't just speak to the Israelites. God spoke to every single entity and being. And this is how you and I can work together to bring God's message. However we choose to interpret it, we are all God's children and want to do what he feels is best for all of us and to walk in his footsteps. Well, Ruth, those are all great thoughts and uh, great to hear the Jewish perspective and, and have you share about that today. Uh, you know, as as evangelicals, and and I'm uh, from the Coastal faith in evangelicalism. You know, we uh, celebrate Pentecost, that coincides with this Jewish holiday as well. And and of course, I referenced it earlier, the story of the um, pouring of the Holy Spirit in the upper room uh, with the disciples, and um, a lot of things that you know that match up. The the fact that it's a pilgrim feast. There's so many people in Jerusalem at the time and this uh, this Holy Spirit outpouring. And so if you're listening or if you're watching how the, the two things connect, how the, the Christian world and the and the Jewish world connect around this uh, this biblical feast or, or holiday of Shavuot. And I always say that it's amazing you know to to understand the Bible says the, the Christian New Testament says that uh, the disciples and others were all there in the upper room, you know, waiting. And 
I believe the reason they were waiting is because they, they were, you know, counting the, the Omer. They were waiting for Pentecost for the feast to arrive. And so um, there's a great connection for anybody watching, listening there. And um, that's how we continue to observe and celebrate this today as, uh, as Christians. Uh, Ruth, I wanted to give you an opportunity. The last time you were with us, you shared about uh, MUNA Angels. You shared a little bit about the organization. Uh, just take a moment and tell our listeners again um, about what it is that, that you do, your organization does, and how people can connect with that. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so Emuna, Emuna Israel is one of Israel's leading and largest social service humanitarian aid organizations. It began in the mid-1930s, actually, by a group of religious Jewish women who wanted to try to uh, save as many Jewish children from the Holocaust and from the Arab world also undergoing persecution, bring them to Israel, and they started to set up um, emergency shelters for these young children, hoping, God willing, that they would be reunited with their parents. Many were, many weren't, as we know. So uh, what happened was Amuna continued to expand. Once they had these children in their care and residential care, they then had to start schools. And they also then started to open up schools around Israel. And then they also started to open therapy centers. We, we were actually one of the first nonprofits to ever include therapeutic services, understanding that one must heal. One must heal both from a religious point of view and spiritually reconnect to God and the source, but also has to heal when you've been through trauma and abuse and neglect. So Amuna deals with some of Israel's most dysfunctional children and families, unfortunately. And we have over 160 projects in the in in Israel. And um, one of the things that people may know or may not, Emuna stands for faith. The name was given specifically because the founders of Emuna had faith that God would protect his children and would bring us back to the land of Israel. When it was started, it wasn't yet modern day Israel, but the faith was there that God would, would have us in mind, and he did. So that's what Amuna Israel is. And I work for World Amuna, which is the global development arm. And my focus is in developing bridges and relationships between the Christian and Jewish community and healing the wounds that we've suffered for 2,000 years, each other, and try to see how we can build together on behalf of the people of Israel. Very good. Well, thank you so much for the work that you do. I believe it's important work, and we certainly appreciate uh, the service that you offer in terms of uh, of your your vocation there. Uh, God bless you, Ruth. It's been great to have you thank on the you. podcast again. Thank and, you. And um, yeah, we look forward to other opportunities that we can uh, that we can share together in the future. God willing, and enjoy the rest of your stay here, Jeff. Thank you very much. You have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. You can listen to this entire podcast on your favorite audio podcast platform. Find the link below. And while you're at it, don't forget to click subscribe and follow us on Facebook so you can stay connected to First Century Foundations.